Hello and welcome to this video. So, Billy Cobham videos on my YouTube are a bit like buses, you know. You wait all this time for one to come along and then suddenly you get two. Um, so, um, a couple of days ago I posted an appreciation of Billy Cobham, who is my drum hero. And, uh, you know, looking at some of the comments, people said they enjoyed the stories. Well, I admitted a whole bunch of stories. There was a few stories I was going to put in the last video, and I decided it's not relevant. It's, it's, it's a bit name-droppy and boasty, and I shouldn't really tell these stories. And then there's, there's not really, there's no point to them, really. But um, a couple of people said they enjoyed the story. So I thought I'd relate um, my um, near misses in terms of meeting my hero Billy Cobham. Uh, so um, this is how I nearly met my hero. So um, in 2000 I was playing drums for Robert Plant. See I told you it would be a bit name droppy. So I was playing drums for Robert Plant in a band called The Priory of Brian. I remember we'd just done a gig in a very posh venue in Nice, sort of luxury almost like being on a luxury holiday and uh, the next gig was in Switzerland and uh, I can remember we um, jumped into a tiny aeroplane, flew over the Alps, landed at Lake Lucerne in this incredible um, hotel we were at which someone told me is where Wagner used to uh, stop in this hotel and we were booked to do a gig um, at the Lucerne, uh, I think it was Jazz and Blues Festival so um, we go down to the sound check, we sound check, uh, and I ask who's playing before us. Uh, now I haven't got the the uh, the disrespect to, or gall to say that um, Billy Cobham was supporting us. He wasn't. He was just on the bill, and he was on earlier. You know, um, if my memory serves me right, it could well be that he was on after. Um, but anyway, we were on the bill with Billy Cobham. Which was a shock to me because, as I said, Billy Cobham is my hero. Um, now, if my memory serves me correctly, we sound checked and this room was going around that Billy was playing, and I was really quite in shock that we were sort of, you know, not just meeting him, but we're sort of playing on equal terms. That's that's a, an intimidating thing for a drummer, you know. You know who's who's on the gig tonight? Who's drumming on the gig tonight? Oh, it's Andy Edwards and uh, Billy Cobham. That's that's a, that's intimidating. So. Um, we sound check and then we go off to get something to eat. And I went off to get some fondues with Robert Plant. So I'm sat there eating the fondues. But I'm aware that uh, Billy Cobham is now on. He's on in the venue. And I'm missing it. Here I am with all the band, you know, out doing stuff. And I'm eating fondues with Robert. So I start to work on Robert and I'm going, you know, can't we go and see Billy Cobham? He's going, oh, you know, I don't, whatever, I'm hungry, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, please, you know, please, please, please. So I eventually nag Robert to go and see Billy Cobham. So we wander over to the venue, we get in there, and I sit watching Billy Cobham, my hero, stood next to another hero of mine, <laughs> and, uh, and my then current employer, Robert Plant, and we watch the gig. Um, and that's quite an experience. Uh, Billy was doing a sort of... Um, big band he had a, a big band it was pretty cool and i remember roberts really enjoyed he enjoyed the big band aspects you know robert robert's not a huge jazz fusion fan but he obviously appreciates good music and he and i think he was he was quite impressed by aspects of it i of course it was incredible I was getting to see billy cobham you know an incredible thing um we then went to uh, the the gig you know and we did our gig later on that night uh, and we went back to the hotel. That's the that's the night over. You know that was what an, what an experience. So I'm sat with my mates. We're having a drink in the hotel bar. We're chatting away, and then of course in walks Billy Cobham, and comes and plonks himself right next to me, sat at this table. And I thought I need to talk to this guy. I need to say hello. I need to introduce myself. Um, so uh, I look around at Billy, and I think, well, what shall I say? Shall I say hi, Billy? Um, you're the reason why I play drums, you know, if I hadn't seen you on the TV when I was two years old, I don't know whether I would have played or whether it would have been any good. And I thought, this does, that's all going to sound so weird. This guy is trying to have a relax after his uh, gig. And <laughs> so I sat there completely in silence until eventually I chickened out and I went up to bed. 
I can remember, I just thought, oh, this is really weird. I wasn't speaking, you know, Billy was sat there relaxing and I didn't say a word and I went to bed and that was it. And I know, and I, and I, I, I really um, kicked myself about this, you know, the fact that I didn't get the chance to talk to my ultimate drum hero. Um, a few years later, um, he was playing at Ronnie Scott's um, in Birmingham. Um, there used to be a Ronnie Scott's in Birmingham, which wasn't too far from where I lived in the UK. So um, I went up very early to see Billy. I think he was playing with Randy Brecker. I'm really convinced he was playing with Randy Brecker. And uh, we get there early and I'm sat on my table and I'm waiting, you know, for the band to come on. And I think the support band starts and out walks Billy and Randy Brecker <laughs> come into the bit where we sat because they want to get a drink. They buy him a drink and then they come and sit at my table <laughs> opposite us watching the gig. Now the thing is, is that here I am, there's a second chance to talk to Billy, and what do I do? I don't say a word. I can't think of anything to say. I can't think of any way of introducing it. You know, there's someone, you know, I, that ostensibly I don't know what am I supposed to do. I've been in this situation a few times and I've, I've met, you know, famous people and, you know, people I'm fans of, but usually there's a context. But here you're just a punter, and I think it's the fact that I am such a fan that I know anything I say is going to sound so gushing and um, uh, and so over the top. It's you're either going to try and play it cool and that's going to seem weird, or you're not. You're going to have to tell the truth and say, you know. So again, I miss my chance. Okay. Now I have a good friend called James Maiden, who's a guitarist. Um, I've known him for many years, and a few years later, he's working at a college about an hour away from me, in Stratford. And Billy Cobham's playing in Stratford, but he needs to rehearse. So he rings up the college and says, look, if you let me rehearse at the college, I'll do you a, a, a master class. This is an incredible thing, you know. How, how, how does this ever happen? How can this happen? And so James, knowing I'm such a huge Billy Cobham fan, he rings me up and says, we've got Billy coming to uh, um, rehearse and play at the college. I think I've got this right, so it's all my... All, all packed in the old memories here, so I might have got little details wrong. So I drive over and I go down and I watch them rehearse. I get to watch him rehearse. I get him to watch him perform and he comes in and plays a little bit for the uh, students, talk to them. Uh, I also got, got to see him with his tech, um, setting his kit up and saw how he worked with that. And then, uh, of course, James comes in and says, uh, you know, do you want some dinner, Andy? I'll take you to dinner. So we go down to the college cafeteria. And I sit down to have my, uh, you know, whatever it is, lasagna and chips. Of course, in work walks Billy Cobham. And comes and plocks himself down a few seats down from where I'm sat. And I can remember thinking, this is incredible. Because I knew at that point I wasn't going to say anything. Because that had become the pattern of events. Uh, and uh, there was no way I could break this. I was now stuck in the ruts of... of uh, continually having Billy Cobb come and sit down to me to eat or drink and not me not saying a word. And I, I remember looking at Billy and uh, uh, I didn't say hello to him and he ate his dinner and he chatted away and then I went in my car and went home. So, bizarrely in my life, I have been provided with, um, you know, three perfect opportunities to meet my hero. Uh, and I, I didn't. Now... Does it really matter in the end? You know, it's nice to be able to say, I met this person, I had a conversation with them. Um, I have met other heroes. Um, I can remember being at a venue with watching Alan Holdsworth, and Alan Holdsworth sort of um, waltzed up to the bar to get a drink, and we were stood there, and I, I had the courage to go and say, hi, Alan, and he went, hi, like that, and uh, that was about it. And then he actually chatted to my friend a little bit, and of course, as Alan always did he said oh sorry for the gig I played really terrible and this had been the like life-changing event for us to see Alan Holdsworth play it, it had been like uh, you know a, a brain frying <laughs> performance the like of which you've never seen anyone else do and there he was putting himself down I've met BB King I've met you know the the guys from Judas Priest from Black Sabbath from Deep Purple you know I've I've um, I've I've, I've uh, done tours with drummers like Simon Phillips and Marco Miniman and 
Mike Portnoy and some of these guys you've got to know well enough to you know be on really friendly terms with you know uh, and I could handle that but this is evidence of really how um, important Billy Cobham is for me as a musician and how important musicians are you know this channel exists because I think people come here because this music really means something to them it's more than just being a fan liking a band having some of their albums um, I think for many of us music is something you discover at a certain age and it's a, it's, it's a journey that you go deeper into it's like an exploration and for many of us it becomes in a way after our family and our, and our loved ones and our health it becomes the most important thing in our lives it becomes a reason to live a reason to get up in the morning um, and certain musicians um, open that door for you there's been a number of them for me um, John McGoughlin is definitely one Miles Davis is definitely one Frank Zappa he's definitely one John Coltrane um, without a doubt um, for me Charlie Parker when I was younger uh, Alan Holdsworth Without a doubt. I, I would even put Steve Vai in there. These are musicians that were more than just I had their albums and I liked. These are musicians that changed me. Took me down a certain route. Um, I would even put in bands like the Red Hot Chili Peppers at one point. Very important to me. Changed my direction. It took me away from being a jazz snob. Um, Bill Laswell. And all his projects made me think differently about production and sound and, 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 and virtuosity. But the uh, the first guy to open that door for me really was Billy Cobham. Um, when I was 12 years old, I started playing drums. I was into heavy metal. I told this story on the last video, but in case you haven't seen that, I'll tell it briefly here. And... Uh, the sort of in the first few weeks I started playing drums, my mum said, "Oh, there's a drum on TV tonight," and Billy Com was doing a, a, a drum masterclass on television. Um, I was 12 years old. These things really change you, you know. To see a musician of that caliber, you know, to see someone who has achieved what they have on the instrument, and really be able to affect you so deeply with what they're doing, that's a profound thing. And here we are, you know, 40 years later, and I can remember that event in my life. It's, you know, seeing Billy Cobham for the first time on television is an event in my life that is really stuck in here. Uh, a few years later, managing to track down a copy of Birds of Fire and knowing about this drummer Billy Cobham and knowing there was this thing around him because I'd seen him on the television and then, and then put in the Mavish Nuxtron and hearing that press roll on one word come in and suddenly realise, oh my God, this is the drummer I saw on TV. This is what he does musically. Now, what the hell is this? And again, I can remember it. I can remember the lighting in the room, the way the sun was coming through the room. I can remember where I was stood and where the speakers are. And I can remember sort of almost looking at the speakers in disbelief, trying to see the music coming out of it because I was so shocked. Why, why does this have such a profound effect? And then when I grow up and meet other musicians and we start to chat, you find out people have very similar experiences, very similar, you know, and then you set up a channel like this and you start talking like this. I mean, I, I, I started talking, you know, about the albums I like, but as time's gone on, I've realized when I just get on camera and talk like this and talk about how much I love the music, it seems to have an effect on other people, I think, because they go, my God, this is what it was like for me. I've had experiences like this. You know, sat behind me is a drum kit. You know, I'm sat in a studio. I mean, I, I, I could be on the drums now telling you what I actually got from Billy Cobb. And I'd love to do that at some point, you know, to actually say, These are the, this is what I got. These are the things he did. But his influence on me was not that. That's just a tiny part of his, of his influence on me. 
His influence was was much more to do with the music. It was it was the spirit in which he played. It was that aesthetic. Um, the only, when he played, it was like he was out to, to almost like obliterate and destroy everything in his path. It was pure power. Okay. Um, no other musician is going to be able to stand up to this unless you're Billy Cobb or Jan Hammer. Um, I felt the same thing when I heard Elvin Jones for the first time. Uh, when I heard Jack DeJohnette for the first time, um, which was on television. And, and watching these drummers and thinking, my God, the way these play, the musicians either stand up or take it, <laughs> or they just get smacked down by the sheer power. That concept's bizarre. I mean, if you're a normal drummer, you know, you're trying to support people, you're trying to, uh, you know, um, make sure they're comfortable and the musicians are relaxed. And of course, Billy's doing all that as well. But there's a, an intensity and an approach that once they notch it up, um, that energy that is there, there's an energy that is out there, right? Um... Sometimes it's not even in the room with you. I don't know what this thing is that I'm talking about now, really. But uh, sometimes it's not even in the room, but sometimes it walks in the room, and if you're lucky enough, it comes to play. You know, if you're lucky enough. Uh, musicians like this, they, they're like antennas. They, they, they just know how to bring that spirit in, that energy in. And once they access it, it's, it's unlimited. Um... I think that's really what I got. Yep, Billy Cobb breaks up the time in a certain way. He, uh, he he plays very rudimentally between his hi-hat and his snare drum. Um, he moves around the kit in unorthodox ways. He often works in circles around the kit. All this I got from Billy Cobb. Um, one of the things I saw him do on that video when I was 12 years old was, was move around the kit with his left hand in, I think, threes, whilst moving around the, this in fours and he played them over the top of each other so they sort of went out and out, in and out of sync polyrhythmically. I'd only started just playing the drums, I didn't even have a drum kit but I set up the cushions on my settee at home in the same pattern and I learned to do it and I could do this thing at 12 years old. I mean I could hardly play the drums, I was trying to nail Highway to Hell but I could do these things so I thought Billy Cobb do it. Eventually when I bought a drum kit I was able to put that onto the drum kit and then I started to work this around, you know, and uh, kids would come around to my house, they show something on the drums, and I say, well, I'll, I'll play in three here, and then it's four here, and then I'll do it all at the same time, and they go, oh, what are you doing? I'm going, well, I'm doing what Billy Cobb showed me. Didn't tell him that. Um, but as soon as you play in a circle around like that on the drums, you have to sit centrally, you have to position yourself in the middle, you have to not be your focus doesn't move around the drums which so many drummers do suddenly your focus has to stay here because you're going off independently around right you're taking sounds from the drum you're lifting sounds out because you're playing from out from your center to the drums and pulling the sounds back Billy Cobb once I saw him interview said hey, drumming's a little bit like being sat in front of a feast and you, you take some food from here and it's beautiful, take some food, oh that tastes nice. You're taking the sounds from the drum rather than trying to put the sounds into the drum. You don't know that when, when you're doing this exercise that Billy has, has shown you on TV. You don't realise that's what you're doing but you have to play like that to centre yourself and to pull the sound out of the drums. Billy pulls the sound out of the drums. You know, when he hits... He hits like, um, you know, rather than doing that, Billy plays like, so the sound is being pulled out of my hand. And in that, you can hit really hard and actually not feel it. The drum can resound and breathe because you haven't choked it, okay? This is the truth, this is the truth. I've just, I've just told you one truth. I wasn't going to, I was just gonna tell you my story. But in the end, I've told you one truth that I got from Billy. Anyway, that's what it is. Music is the truth, isn't it? And that's all we can say. Uh, I love Billy Cobham. It's so brilliant to be able to do these videos. It's so brilliant to, be able to talk about this. 
Um, I hope people appreciate this. This video, I wasn't planning on doing, so this is totally just bonkers off the top of my head stuff. So if you like the more bonkers off the top of my head stuff, just ask for it. You know, I'll do more of this if you love love it. So haven't been any holding any albums up, haven't been ranking anything. I've just been chatting about one of my favourite musicians. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you very much for watching.